Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Mike Beam, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Kansas Secretary of Agriculture. I want to welcome you to the sixth annual Kansas Summit on Agricultural Growth. Uh, I appreciate uh, your time this evening uh, to have a discussion about the opportunities for especially livestock uh, in Kansas. Although this year, uh, our Ag Growth Summit uh, we'll be back in person for the main event uh, next month, but based on last year's uh, interaction, we decided to continue with the sector breakouts uh, ahead of that and, and do it uh, virtually so that it's most convenient for each of those who have an interest in various sectors uh, to meet in advance and give us some really good feedback. Uh, please know that uh, we realize at the Kansas Department of Agriculture that the strength of Kansas agriculture comes from all of our producers' hard work, uh, as well as the serv agri-services that uh, are part of the agricultural industry in the state. And we want to include everyone as we discuss uh, strategies that will help grow uh, our agricultural industry. But tonight, specifically talking about how we best serve and how we can support, uh, especially livestock sector. So thanks again for taking uh, time out of your evening. Uh, I do encourage you to participate uh, as uh, you'll understand uh, with the instructions on how to do so, but please uh, give us your feedback. So at this time, uh, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Carrie Weefold. Carrie. Very good, thank you, Secretary Beam. I am Carrie Weefald, and I work here at the Kansas Department of Agriculture in the Division of Agriculture Marketing. And we're just really glad that you've chosen to spend some time with us this evening to visit about the specialty livestock industry here in the state of Kansas. We will be spending the next hour and a half together, learning, listening, hearing, and being encouraged um, from content experts as well as producers within the Kansas specialty livestock industry. Um, we know here at the Department of Agriculture that this sector is very wide and diverse. Um, Kansas has many species that reside within the specialty livestock area, such as goats, sheep, bison, alpacas, llamas, buffalo, just to name a few. Um, compared to our more traditional livestock, our specialty livestock farms tend to be a bit smaller. However, we still rank in USDA NAS reporting. In 2021, um, USDA NAS reported Kansas ranking 12th and 14th in the nation in meat, goat, and market sheep inventory, respectively. Also, when we look back to our 2017 Census of Agriculture, which is the most recent census on publication, Kansas ranks 10th in bison with over 5,727 head raised on 90, about 95 farms across the state. At that time um, of the census, Kansas also totaled about 1,500 alpacas, more than 500 llamas, and all, almost 11,500 rabbits in our inventory. So that's a lot, very diverse. Um, the vision of our agency, though, is to really provide an ideal environment for long-term sustainable agriculture prosperity and statewide growth, no matter what agriculture sector you might reside in. Our summit sector sessions provide a platform for us to entertain opportunities and open dialogue about ways we can advance certain sectors within our state. So tonight, we are really excited to share with you um, content experts as well as producers from across the state who have a vested interest in the specialty livestock industry. I do have a few housekeeping reminders though before we introduce our first speaker. The first is during the presentation portion, which we will have three content experts during our first presentation portion. All participant microphones will be muted by our meeting host if you haven't already muted yourself. If you do have a question during the presentation, feel free to drop it in the chat box. My colleague Tori Laird will pick that question up and direct it accordingly. The host will grant permission to unmute after we move out of the presentation part. So if you do have a question, you're always happy. Uh, we welcome you to ask that. But we also ask of you that perhaps you give your name, um, where you're joining us from, and then if there's a specific sector uh, within especially livestock area that you have interest in. 
Um, at any time during the call, if you need any assistance, you can always raise your hand or you can message us individually in the chat box. And lastly, our session this evening is being recorded and will be posted online on our Kansas Agriculture Growth website with our other sector area sessions um, that are taking place between now and August 26th, which is our in-person growth summit. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our first presenter in Dr. Emily Ruppert. Um, I will tell you Dr. Ruppert is traveling today. So if we have any connectivity issues, let's just be patient. And then she does need to exit um, not long after her presentation. So if you have any questions specific to Dr. Ruppert, please drop those in the chat box and we'll make sure we get those to Dr. Ruppert before she leaves or at least provide you with her contact information. Dr. Ruppert received her Doctorate of Veterinary Medicine from Colorado State University and completed her residency at Oklahoma State University. Dr. Ruppert's basic science research interest is in tick-borne diseases, and her primary clinical research interest is in therapy for the management of urinary diseases in ruminants and management of metabolic diseases in small ruminants and camelids. She is currently an associate professor in agricultural practices with the College of Veterinary Medicine at K-State. She teaches food animal medicine and surgery clinics to third and fourth year students. Dr. Ruppert enjoys running, cooking, and spending time with her terrier mix, whose name is Ralph. So uh, please help me welcome joining, or welcome in, join me in welcoming Dr. Ruppert for her presentation today. Thank you, Carrie. Can you, everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Well, my first comment is yes, I'm traveling, so I apologize for any connection issues we might have and then also for any strange uh, vehicular noises in the background here. Um, but I'm really honored to have been asked to speak to this particular um, group of, of, of producers and uh, interested individuals. I obviously have a huge interest in camelids, small ruminants. Um, and so I'm really excited to just give some information um, today. Next slide, please. So I thought that I would start with a little bit of an introduction about what exactly it is that we do at K-State with regards to providing um, service, education, and, and research with regards to camelids. So this picture here, I'm pictured in the center, um, surrounded by the other uh, senior faculty that work in the veterinary teaching hospital. Um, on the far left is Dr. Brian Weaver. Um, to the right of him is Dr. Leslie Weaver, myself, um, then Dr. Matt Meisner and Dr. Sean Huger. And so we are all veterinarians that work at the veterinary teaching hospital in a variety of different capacities, but we all have a clinical appointment. And so um, if you were to come to the vet school with one of your llamas or alpacas, these are the four primary veterinarians that you would be working with. Next slide, please. One of the primary functions that we provide at the vet school is we provide um, service, so primary and referral level care for all livestock species, including llamas and alpacas and um, that precious crea there that's struggling. We provide in-hospital services as well as on-farm services, um, as well as 24-hour emergency uh, care as well. Next slide, please. We obviously have a huge teaching component as well, and so one specific area that we have tried to focus on, um, K-State is unique in that we have a teaching herd of alpacas that has been um, generously supported by not only the university, but local producers, um, the Midwest Alpaca Foundation, um, and it has really been a tremendous opportunity for our students to get hands-on practical skills with regards to restraint of llamas and alpacas, as well as um, just practicing basic um, handling uh, features such as blood draws, foot trimming, um, and just getting exposed to them in general. And so this is a group of third-year veterinary students that are 
practicing physical exams on some of our teaching alpacas. Next slide, please. The other area that the university, specifically the vet school has um, focused or has a focus is with regards to research. And so we have performed um, historically some research with our teaching herd. Um, the most recent project was done by myself, um, and this is Dr. Mike Kleinhens, one of my research colleagues, and we were looking at um, the pharmacokinetics of a new anti-inflammatory in our alpaca species. And so um, while there isn't a lot of research that's actively being done on llamas and alpacas, that's some of the stuff that we've been able to do because we do have our research herd here. Next slide, please. This is probably not new information for most of the people that are going to be listening to this, but just some general information relative to our other livestock species. Camelids are in general, relatively recent additions to the domestic herbivore population. So the first llamas and alpacas were imported to the United States in the late 70s and early 80s. And since that time, uh, for a variety of different reasons, owners have struggled to find um, veterinary care. Next slide, please. So one of the reasons that veterinary care has been a challenge for producers um, is largely due to a general lack of knowledge, potentially, and then also um, not a lot of comfort necessarily with 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 the species in general, with certain with certain populations of veterinarians, just because of lack of experience working with them. So some of the common diseases that we see in camelids in this part of the country, um, I'm going to review. And next slide, please. Probably one of the most important diseases or body systems that seems to be affected that, that we will see a lot of camelids will, would be gastrointestinal disease. And so that can range from anything from um, GI parasites to dental disease, and then also certain cancers that affect um, the GI system as well. The parasite of most note is probably the barber pole worm, which I'm not sure what Dr. Crane is going to talk about, but is certainly a problem in sheep and goats as well. Um, that's the one that um, causes disease by consuming blood from the, the host animal. And as a result, the animals can become um, anemic and very weak. Um, additionally, the other parasite that we see that doesn't really affect the gastrointestinal disease um, but is what we call the meningeal worm, and so um, can cause some pretty serious um, neurologic deficits in llamas and alpacas, and we do have that, unfortunately, in the state of Kansas, and that's something that we uh, see and treat all the time. But this is kind of a cool image. This is a, actually a CT scan of an alpaca that has a tooth root abscess. Um, and one of the things that we have the ability to do here at the university is get some of these awesome diagnostics so that we can know which teeth are affected and um, remove them as needed. So um, again, just one of the things that we commonly see. Next slide, please. The other rather unfortunate thing that we see in the llamas and alpacas are a, a series of congenital abnormalities. And part of that has to do with just this relative small gene pool relative to some of our other species or other breeds of livestock. Um, and the two that we see probably the most commonly, one is a devastating disease called uh, coenolytresia, which is essentially where they're born without um, a way to breathe through their nose um, and is almost essentially um, fatal. And so that's what's being demonstrated in the Korea on the left. The, they shouldn't flare their nose like that and they shouldn't be open mouth breathing because llamas and alpacas are kind of unique species in that they are what we call uh, obligate nasal breathers. So they can't actually get air into their lungs by opening their mouth. They have to be able to breathe through their nasal passage. And then this other one is what we call atresia ani, which is where they are born um, without an anus essentially. And so um, another reason that we see uh, very young um, Kriyas in the clinic. Next slide, please.
Another condition, obviously these creatures were um, bred for a relatively cool climate in the Andes. And as a result of that, um, in the hot, humid summer months in particular, um, if llamas and alpacas are not appropriately shorn um, or shorn ahead of the really hot, humid season, one condition that, that we can see is, is heat stress. So really they lose the ability to thermoregulate when they have that really dense, beautiful fiber. Um, so this is actually, a, any cattle producers out there, this is what we call an aqua cow. Um, but in this instance, it's a aqua llama or aqua alpaca. Um, and it's basically, we're providing physical therapy to this alpaca that had heat stress. Actually, I think this is a llama um, that had heat stress. And so the, the water provides some buoyancy um, and then they can kind of uh, walk and get some physical therapy in, in this um, aqua cow. But heat stress is something that we battle with here in, in Kansas. Next slide, please. Another um, disease that we'll see in llamas and alpacas are external parasites as well as internal parasites. So the, the two external parasites that we see most commonly are mites. So pictured on the right, that crazy looking scary bug is actually a microscopic. So that's a microscope picture of a mite. Um, and this is actually one of our herd animals. And the alopecia or hair loss on the nose and on the tips of the ears is something that we will commonly see when they have a mite um, infestation. And then the other thing that we'll see are ear ticks. And the ear ticks can be particularly problematic because they can lead to an inner ear infection um, that can become really a, a serious neurologic problem if they, if they go untreated. So external parasites, those are unfortunately something that we deal with in the state of Kansas as well. Next slide, please. If we aren't looking at a baby or a neonatal um, crea because of one of those congenital abnormalities that I talked about previously, another one is septicemia. So they, they basically are either born with an infection in their blood or they acquire it shortly after birth. And so um, something that um, anybody that's raised alpacas has probably dealt with at least on some level. And um, one of the most important things to prevent that is to make sure that the crea is nursed from the dam immediately um, following birth. And so this little crea here is um, hospitalized because it had neonatal septicemia um, and it's nursing from its dam there. Next slide, please. Again, this is a, actually a picture of the ear infection that I was just describing. So uh, a tick infestation, um, if it goes unidentified in the ear can lead to an inner ear infection. So on the left side of the screen, that um, kind of blackish area, that's normal. And then if you look at it at the right side, I realize that none of us are probably radiologists looking at this, but I think you can tell there's a definite difference on the right side. There's way more gray um, and that just shows destruction of bone. And so those ear ticks can set up an infection that can go from the ear and travel actually into, um, into the bony structures associated with the ear canal. And that has some really devastating consequences. So just something to look out for. Next slide, please. So our general recommendation for anybody that is looking to get into llamas or alpacas would be to utilize information from reputable breeders. They are going to be some of your best resources, particularly um, when it comes to veterinary care in your general area. Um, because I think one of the most important things is to try to identify, contact, and develop a relationship with a veterinarian that feels comfortable working with llamas and alpacas prior to having a problem. Um, their veterinarian is way more likely to uh, number one, be helpful if they know a little bit about your operation, what your goals are, but also if they have a previously established relationship to help you when you have an emergency situation. So again, um, the vet school is always um, willing and ready to, to help, but we're not also um, centrally located for, for all producers. Um, so again, utilize your local breeders in the area um, to help you identify uh, a veterinarian that can help you um, with your llamas and alpacas. And then I think the other thing, you know, in a lot, in some of our other livestock species, we can sometimes 
maybe wait a little bit longer before we seek veterinary care. Llamas and alpacas are incredibly stoic animals. By the time they are demonstrating clinical illness, they are probably very, very sick. And so um, unlike some of our other livestock species, we really um, suggest that if you are having a problem, see an abnormality, that you seek veterinary care immediately um, and do not wait. Next slide, please. So with that, this is probably one of my most favorite pictures. Um, you can see Dr. Huger in there. If you play Where's Waldo, Dr. Meisner is at the back. Um, and this is actually veterinarians that graduated in May. This is them as first years um, out with our teaching herd um, there at K-State. So I would be happy to entertain any questions that anybody has. And again, um, I'm honored to get to speak and um, we are always, always happy to answer any and all questions about llamas, alpacas, any livestock species. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Ruppert. I certainly learned information from your presentation and I hope those on the call also uh, were able to learn a thing or two about taking care of the camelids. Are there any questions or thoughts or comments back to Dr. Ruppert before she transitions on? I am not seeing any questions coming through for Dr. Ruppert at this time. There are some more questions coming through that we can pose later on in the session. Um, but at this time, it looks like Dr. Ruppert, I am not seeing any of the questions, but I will wait another moment, see if any more comes through and pose it to you if I see it come through. Very good. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Ruppert and Tori. We're going to continue on. I do know we have some conversation in the chat box. Uh, regarding beekeepers. We'll get to those a little bit later in the session, unless any of our veterinarians um, or extension specialists have um, specific examples or responses to those. Our next presenter this evening is Dr. Allison Crane. Dr. Crane was raised in Warrior, Alabama on a small horse farm, assisting her father with shoeing horses, as well as barrel racing and team roping. Dr. Crane's interest in agriculture grew through her father's business and working for a Brangus Ranch and large animal veterinarian in Northern Alabama. Dr. Crane graduated with a bachelor's degree in animal science from Berry College in 2012 and subsequently her master's of science in 2014 and her doctorate in 2017 in ruminant nutrition and reproductive physiology from North Dakota State University. In 2017, Dr. Crane was hired as our state sheep and meat goat extension specialist with a 70% extension appointment and a 30% teaching appointment. So uh, please help me welcome Dr. Crane. Um, so hi, I'm Dr. Allison Crane. I am the K-State sheep and meat goat extension specialist. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, and like Dr. Ruppert said, I'm really happy to get to talk to you guys today. Um, I know it said that I was going to talk about care um, of small ruminants uh, on the agenda, but today I wanted to talk to you guys about multi-species grazing, um, and that way I can kind of include some other species as well um, into the presentation. Um, it is mostly focused on incorporating sheep and goats um, into an operation, um, into a grazing system, and what they can do. Um, but I do have some data on some other animals as well that can be included in those operations. Um, also, I wanted to clarify, there's a lot of words on some of these slides, a lot of information, so I'm not going to be able to talk through all of the information, but I wanted to be able to share the slides with all of you so that you can go back and look at some of that information. Okay, so first thing is there's a lot of different grazing systems out there that people talk about, people incorporate into their operation. Um, and you probably hear a lot of these terms and it can be confusing. Some of these terms mean similar things. Um, so I wanted to go through and clarify what some of these different systems are. Um, so underneath um, that second line, it's continuous controlled strip, co-species, multi-species um, are all common terms um, that I'm about to talk about. So continuous grazing systems are 
probably the most predominant throughout the country. Um, continuous grazing is typically the maintain an animal um, on one pasture throughout an entire grazing season or on very large parcels of land. And they might just move between a couple of those um, throughout one grazing season. Um, so there's not a lot of management being done there on a day-to-day -day basis or even a weekly basis um, throughout that grazing season. Um, we're talking about sheep and goats specifically in this. So um, those animals are making the management decisions themselves. Um, so what, where to graze, what to graze, where to congregate, um, if they're gonna selectively graze, um, that's actually not typically gonna happen unless there's just a spot that they wanna go to in a pasture. Um, so maybe a high spot, maybe a low spot, um, depending on what the environment is. Um, and really the only way we're gonna be able to see selective grazing in these scenarios is actually if our stocking rate for the number of animals per acre is too high. Um, and that's just because we're putting more pressure on that land. Um, in this scenario, they also tend to overgraze certain plants, so the ones that they prefer, and then they're gonna undergraze other plant species. Um, if they will, you'll see some less preferred plants um, being grazed if your stocking density um, is not adjusted accordingly. Um, so it's really important in any of these grazing systems that you're paying attention to what your grass looks like, pay, paying attention to stubble height, um, and then what's being grazed and what's not, especially if you're um, concerned about land health. Um, the forage availability may be ideal in certain times of the grazing season, but it might be too high or too low um, at different points in the grazing season, and even according to different grazing seasons, whether there's a drought um, or you know, a few years ago we had um, a flood throughout the spring and even into some of the summer. Um, and so certain areas we had too much grass um, and then other years we might not have enough grass at all. And you wanna be paying attention to those things, have some kind of monitoring system of your grasses uh, so that you know how to adjust your stocking density. Um, another way that we can manage a little more fine tuning in a continuous grazing system is by implementing temporary fencing systems. So you can fence off certain portions of a pasture or a paddock. Um, if you do have surplus and you can harvest that as hay, um, but if we're trying to protect a certain area of land or certain plants at a certain time of year, um, or if there's an overgrazed section, you can fence that off and keep them out of that area. Okay, the next one is a controlled grazing system. So controlled is just telling you you have implemented some type of a controlled management grazing system, so it's not continuous. So a lot of different grazing systems fall under controlled. Um, so in this system, a pasture or a paddock will be grazed for a limited amount of time. Um, some people will graze for one to two days if it's a really small paddock, or if you just have a lot of animals in a mid-sized paddock. Um, and then they're gonna be rotating more often. Um, or some people are gonna be rotating one to two weeks. Um, typically the rule of thumb is that you don't want your grass stubble to reach less than four inches of height. And Dr. Ruppert mentioned some of our parasites that we struggle with in our small ruminants. Um, most of those larvae cannot actually go up a grass stalk more than four to six inches of height. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we have that rule of thumb. So don't graze below that four to six inches of height um, whenever we can. Um, we're gonna decrease our parasite loads in the sheep and goats if we implement that rule. And we'll also have healthier grasses because another thing that happens when we um, leave four to six inches of stand available, we're leaving more leaflets on the grass plants and they need those leaflets to actually undergo photosynthesis and regenerate more of a plant. Um, so you're gonna get better regrowth um, when we leave that much plant behind. Um, if we have smaller paddocks, you're gonna have more success because you're gonna be doing more management um, and you're gonna have more selection as far as what those sheep and goats are gonna be grazing. Um, 
so you want to leave some leaves, like I said, to allow for some recovery. Um, and with this system, any type of controlled system, we typically see an increased plant diversity um, as a result. So the uses, we can implement some pasture improvement, especially here in the Flint Hills by implementing a controlled system. We can extend our grazing seasons, um, improve the quality of the forage, the fishing for the goats are getting. Um, and if we're implementing this in an already established cattle grazing system, the cattle are also going to um, have that increased um, quality forage available. And like I said, we're going to reduce our parasite loads as well. So another type of controlled grazing system that's relatively common is strip grazing. And uh, you can see that in that picture on the slide. Um, they've implemented these temporary fences um, throughout this paddock to kind of split it up. And the goats are in these different strips. Typically you would have the goats in one strip and you would um, continually move that temporary fence further and further out to allow them more area to graze. Um, and so you're just forcing them to graze the area they're in and then allowing them a larger and larger section over time. And so you would move that every two to three days. Um, with this system, like I said, you're going to increase your pasture utilization. We also typically see, um, especially in peak grazing season, um, increased average daily gain, increased gains per acre, um, and a, with that, a rapid increase in body condition scores of the animals. Uh, we want to use this system when our pasture is highly vegetative and high quality. Um, so that's typically going to be in some of our cooler weather, um, so not in the dead of summer. Um, or if we're using some stockpiled fescue pastures um, in the late fall or early winter. Uh, when we have low quality forage available, um, cattle and sheep can still fare pretty well in the system, but the goats are gonna tend to be too selective in, the, in that um, system uh, when we run into low quality forage. Okay, so some good versus bad. Um, when we implement controlled grazing systems of any kind, we get higher utilization because we have more control of what the sheep or the goats or any animal for that matter is consuming. Um, in seasons of fast growth or excess growth, um, we can utilize what the sheep and the goats are not consuming as hay, um, so storing forage for later on in the year. Um, we can also stretch our season or stretch the availability. Um, but we're also going to be forcing consumption of less palatable plants, and depending on our rotation, especially if we have multiple species in the system, um, we can really make cheaper goats or llamas or alpacas um, or anything else we might be grazing, force them to eat things that cattle won't, and then graze the cattle in behind them. Um, but some other things that people don't think about, and these can be negative as well as positive, depending on your point of view, your animals are going to tend to be tamer in these situations because you're seeing them more often, you're handling them more often. Um, you're going to have less waste because you're going to have less trampling in most cases and less urine and dung um, concentration. So it's going to be more evenly distributed. Um, you're going to be seeing the animals more. So you're going to typically have better management on a day-to-day -day basis of the animals. Um, the negatives is it can be a higher cost because there is some temporary fencing. Sometimes you have to have more fencing if you're trying to make um, smaller permanent paddock fences. Um, you have to think about predators. Um, if you're bringing in sheep or goats or other small ruminants into the scenario with cattle. Um, sometimes if we don't really think about how we're going to lay out pastures um, and we're putting in these new fence lines, uh, we can actually force them to overgraze certain areas that they were already going to prefer. So we're pushing them into those spots. Um, and we can make force some wet or dry areas. Um, and then if we give too long of a rest period to some of this land, uh, we're going to have too much forage available and not be able to get a rep back around to it before it actually um, matures um, to a point where it becomes low quality. All right, so this is one of those slides, there's a lot of information on it, but the thing I really wanted to point out here is that behavior amongst all species of our grazing animals differs um, from cattle to sheep, to goats, to llamas, 
alpacas, bison, elk, deer, whatever we're talking about, um, they all differ. And I have a table in here where you can actually see how much they differ. Um, and we want to be able to utilize that. And so one of the best ways we can do that is by observation of what the sheep, goat, animal is doing um, when they're out grazing. What are they eating? How long are they spending in certain areas? And no one's going to know that like the person that's there managing them. Um, and it can even differ by breed. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to that and managing it to the best of your ability um, and not overgrazing and not um, undergrazing and leaving forage behind and wasting forage. Um, so we want to use their habits, their grazing habits to complement the pasture, the forage that we have available. Um, so when we talk about implementing small ruminants, um, camelids into a cattle operation. Uh, one of the biggest benefits is that parasite load, decreasing the parasite load. And cattle are a dead end for most of our parasites um, that we have in sheep and goats. And so a lot of people don't want to graze with the cattle. Um, it's actually one of the best ways that we can um, lower our predation rates is actually bonding the sheep or the goats or whatever we're talking about to the cows. The cows kind of ward off coyotes in that scenario. Um, and it can take a couple of weeks, but um, it works very well in most cases. Um, but if they don't, if you don't want to do that, if that's not the appealing scenario, uh, we actually suggest that um, whatever animal has the highest nutritional need, that they graze the pasture first so that they're getting the nutrients that they need um, before you're actually making them select, be more highly selective of their forages. Um, so this is that table I was talking about um, that kind of breaks down across a few different species of um, animals and talking about what they prefer grass over um, forages versus browse plants. So some of the major things to consider um, in implementing some of these systems is, like I said, aligning the nutritional need of the animal with the stage of production that they are in. Um, so if they don't need a whole lot of nutrition, you can really force them to be more selective. Um, you also want to pay attention to your stocking rates um, so that you're not overgrazing or undergrazing. Um, predator control is necessary in a lot of these scenarios, whether that's a dog um, or bonding them with another species of animal that can provide protection. Um, implementing proper fencing. And then knowing some of our rules of thumb for stocking rates um, with other species. So for sheep to cattle, it's usually a five to one ratio um, and goats, it's usually a six to one ratio goats to cows. Um, but in a lot of these controlled scenarios, we can increase our stocking rates by about 25% on a lot of pastures. Um, so these are some old pictures from North Dakota where they actually used controlled grazing systems. Um, this is with sheep in particular to control some of the invasive species of plants that we have problems with. In this case, it's leafy spurge. Um, here in Kansas, we have the wild honeysuckle um, that we can also control with small ruminants um, as well as a lot of others. Um, you see goats can be used to control that underbrush. Um, and in this scenario, goats especially can make some of our invasive shrubs vulnerable to things like fire. Um, so grazing them with the goats and then following them up with fire, fire can actually be very useful in controlling um, some of our invasive species. So some of these pictures, um, this last thing I have are from a producer in Kansas, um, cattle producer in Kansas that has implemented um, co-species grazing with sheep in his pastures and has seen great improvements um, in his pastures. So these are actually some videos. I'm not going to play them right now um, of the changes. I mean, you can pretty obviously see in this picture that through just one grazing season with sheep on these pastures, uh, he's definitely cleared up some of this undergrowth and some pastures that he has. Um, and then these are just some more pictures that he provided of these pastures. Um, so the sheep have done a really good job um, grazing with the cattle wooden. Um, and then this last picture um, has some of my information on it. If you have any questions, because I know I had to kind of rush through this pretty fast. Um, 
but in that the background of the picture, um, you can see where the cows are, and that's where the cows grazed um, that year. And he wanted a fence line comparison. That pasture right beside it is actually where the sheep were. Um, so they pretty obviously cleaned up that pasture. Um, and he's actually been doing this for every year since these pictures were taken. And he said that they've just continually improved. Um, he's pretty happy with it. Um, and more and more people are getting interested in co-species or multi-species grazing, um, which is why I want to talk about it today. And with that, I thank you for letting me talk to you guys today. And I will hopefully be able to answer any questions you might have. Very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Crane, for sharing that information on um, sheep and goats and grazing and all of the good work that um, you contribute to the state of Kansas and the producer outreach and support that you provide our producers. We're gonna continue on. Um, I see we have some chat comments coming in. Um, we're gonna move on to Dr. Guardhouse and then we'll have a pause. And if any of our, um, our specialists would like to provide information back um, to the comments, we certainly will allow time for that. And Tori will leave that session. So our third content expert is Dr. Sarah Guardhouse. Dr. Guardhouse graduated from the Ontario Veterinary College in Guelph, Ontario in 2012. She then went on to complete an exotics internship in 2013 at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine in Saskatchewan, followed by a small animal rotating internship at Kansas State University in 2014. She then completed a three-year residency in zoological companion animal medicine and surgery at University of Cal California, Davis. She then returned to Ontario Veterinary College as a clinical specialist, and then eventually um, transitioned back here to Kansas, where she is an assistant professor in the exotic pet, wildlife, and zoological medicine department here at the College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Guardhouse, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. Can everyone see my screen and hear me okay? We can, thank you. Perfect. Um, so tonight I'm just gonna go kind of over a brief overview of rabbit production, both husbandry and welfare um, in, in this species. So I think first, one of the things that we should always ask ourselves is why are rabbits in production? And there's a lot of different reasons that we use them. So not only for meat and their wool, um, but we also use rabbits for breeding stock, for laboratory use, like you can see in this image here, um, for their skin and their hide, as well as for youth programs, like in this image here. So lots of different uses for rabbits in production medicine. I think what's also important to keep in mind is the differing breeds. So there's actually a lot of different rabbit breeds that are used in production medicine. And so I've done a couple of tables here just to kind of give an idea of what some of these breeds look like, what their sizes are like, and then what their most common uses are. So um, the American chinchilla named for its fur color and looking somewhat like a chinchilla is a blue gray bunny. Um, they're quite a bit of a larger rabbit. Um, our Californian rabbit, they can have these unique features with their white, um, with kind of black tipping on their nose, their ears, and their feet, um, and they're commonly used for meat and fur. And then these Dutch bunnies um, are most commonly used in laboratory uses. They're quite small, um, and they have this kind of classic band of fur um, on their body that you can see there. Other common breeds that are used in production are your English spot rabbits. So you can see um, why they're named that way based on this picture. Um, the Flemish giant, which is a very large breed of rabbit, um, most commonly used for meat. And then our New Zealand rabbits have a lot of different uses. And I think something important to point out is that people think of New Zealand's as being most commonly white, um, but there are New Zealand reds and blacks as well. And you can see a picture of the red New Zealand red variety right there. So one of the important things to keep in mind when thinking about a successful rabbit operation is to know um, how to select your stock. And so the having a prime stock selection is what is going to lead to a success or failure of that rabbit operation. And so things that we want to think about looking for are the health of the rabbits, their vigor, their longevity, do they have a good history with reproduction? And then do they have appropriate and good confirmation? And one of the ways that we can do this to make sure that we're selecting things properly is to get records from the breeder. So that's a key feature of this. 
Housing is very important. So there's a lot of factors to consider. And if they don't have proper housing, then their health is also not going to be uh, appropriate. And so things that we need to think about are the climate, um, how large or small scale that operation is. So it could range anywhere from small to large. And then what type of production system the rabbits are going to be in. So is it going to be intensive, extensive, or semi-intensive? And so those are all going to be factors that play into how you decide to house your rabbits. One of the really important things is the cage or hutch construct. And so there's varying on opinions on how we should house these bunnies. Um, one of the important things is that wire is often at least recommended for the sides and the roof over wood. And the reason for that is because it's much easier to clean and disinfect. So if you have wire and you can clean and disinfect it easier, that also means that you're likely to be able to see less disease in your herd of rabbits. Um, and then just thinking about that, I think logically it makes sense. We know that wood absorbs urine and water, so that's going to be really difficult for us to sanitize. The other thing is that rabbits like to chew on everything. And so if they have a wood hutch, they're likely to kind of gnaw on the bars of that hutch and kind of, you know, potentially cause trauma to their mouth or destroy the hutch that you have. Um, and overall, just the wire is going to be more durable for those bars. The flooring is also somewhat of a bit controversial in terms of what is best for these rabbits. Um, and so one of the strong recommendations is wire mesh and that comes with both pros and cons. So if you think about it, it's somewhat self-cleaning. So all of their urine and feces are gonna fall down below. So the rabbit is not sitting in them. So that's a benefit to it for sure. Um, and this can be really useful, especially in our large operations where you know we potentially don't have that significant amount of time to be cleaning their hutches um, on a you know really routine basis. Rabbits like to um, have very frequent uh, urination and defecation, so it can be challenging to keep up with that. On the flip side of that, however, the wire is not great for the bottom of their feet. So one of the things that we see commonly with rabbits housed on wire is pododermatitis, um, which is commonly referred to as sore hocks. Um, and so some ways that we can kind of circumvent this is to potentially have a wire floor, but then have an area that is solid that they can rest on and stand on um, to give their feet a break from that wire floor. The problem with the solid floors, like I mentioned, is that that is sanitation. So they may not drain very well. Um, the rabbit may end up just sitting in its urine and feces all day. And so one thing that can potentially help with that at least is to have a bit of a sloped floor for them. The cage size is also very important. So from a welfare standpoint, this is really, really important for the rabbit's quality of life um, and also to help to provide good ventilation for them. And so we wanna make sure that those bunnies can stand on their back feet, turn around completely and stretch out completely. And I think those are kind of our minimums when we think about what we need to provide for them. Um, so have I've kind of given some recommendations based on the sizes and then this is where that table is also nice and useful to go back to. You can kind of get an idea of what size of rabbit you have and what kind of the minimum recommendations are for them. And of course, always more room is gonna be better for them in terms of kind of their quality of life, um, but also respecting that that can be somewhat challenging in a, in a high production facility. Uh, so this is just an example of what some of the kind of constructs might look like. Um, the tiers have pros and cons as well. Um, so the more tiers that you have, it is going to make it harder for those that are managing those bunnies. So if you have to crouch up and down or get on a ladder to feed and water them or to clean them, obviously that is going to decrease efficiency. So from a production standpoint, having multiple tiers may not be the most beneficial um, for you. I think it's also important that we keep in mind the ways that we provide them with their basic necessities. So water containers, um, rabbits are very good at tipping over lightweight water bowls. And so if you are going to provide them water in a bowl, um, I would recommend something like these ceramic crocs that are quite heavy and that rabbits can't tip over. Um, they also do well with bottle kind of tube watering systems. Um, some rabbits will learn what those are and will actually play with them and empty them. So those need to be monitored very closely. And then automatic waters of, are of course another option as well. The biggest thing is making sure that whatever they have is functional, always has water available to them and that it's clean and fresh. Um, similar is our feed container. So these crocs also work really well for their pellets. 
Um, you can also provide them with troughs or grass mangers for their hay uh, portion of their diet. And then if they are does um, that are going to be uh, giving birth, then making sure that they have nest boxes because that's super important for them. They like to build quite elaborate nests when they're about to give birth. Uh, it is strongly advised not to keep does and bucks in the same cage. And the reason for that is that um, you know, there's potential for trauma and harm to each other. And so really what's recommended is to only keep them together long enough for mating to occur um, and then to separate them again after that. And I think the other thing that we need to think, to think about when we think about their housing is that we want to make sure that they're safe and protected. And so depending on the, if they live indoors or outdoors, um, a lot of these bunnies are going to be living outdoors. And so making sure that they have protection from the elements. So the rain, direct sunlight, as well as predators. So those are gonna be um, really key considerations if they are outside. And then also thinking about the in, inside of the cage or of the hutch and the construct of it. And is, it, is there anything in that hutch that could injure the rabbit from the inside? So this just looks at different types of housing and their advantages and disadvantages. And so um, our indoor hutches, though very expensive at times, um, do definitely provide quite a few benefits. So they can protect them from the elements, they protect them from predators, um, and because they're indoors, they're going to be a lot easier to clean and disinfect versus our outdoor hutches, which are a more affordable option, but then they do also get exposed to the elements, they get exposed to predators, and they may be harder to clean in those scenarios. And then in you know smaller operations, the floor method, meaning basically the rabbits kind of on the ground, on the ground, they have a simple box and maybe some kind of um, way of kind of blocking them in, that might be the simplest and, and easiest route for very small operations. What's also important to consider is nutrition. Um, so in rabbits, they can certainly survive on forages alone. And when we look at them from a pet type setting, that is often more our recommendation. Um, but we know from a production type setting, we also have to think about their productivity. And so the addition of grains and other things can help to improve the herd productivity. And one of the most major expenses of keeping rabbits is feeding them. So they are not, not cheap um, to, to be able to feed and raise. So we think about their nutrition based on their dietary needs, and that's based on whether they're growing and fattening, whether they're resting does and bucks. So are they not pregnant and not lactating? Um, are they pregnant? And then are they lactating does with litters? And each of those classes is going to have varying dietary needs. And I think, you know, based on kind of just looking in the, at that, you can tell who would need more calories and more protein and more calcium than those that wouldn't. And so your resting does and bucks are going to probably be lowest calories, lowest protein, that sort of thing. And your goal is that you really want to look at what meets the needs of each of those specific groups, and that will allow them to perform to the best of their ability and then ensure most optimal productivity in your herd. So certainly they should always have as much grasses and legumes as possible um, available to them. And, and like I said, in, in many scenarios, that is all that rabbits need. Um, but from a production standpoint, then it is also recommended that there's a commercial feed added into that. And usually the recommendation is at least 16% crude protein. Um, the amount of commercial feed will depend on the group of rabbits. So those four groups of rabbits we go back to, you know, again, the ones that are higher producing may need have higher demands than those that are resting and, and not producing at that time. Um, they need fresh water always. And something that I think is quite surprising with rabbits is that they have a remarkably high water consumption. So much higher than a lot of other mammals that we know. And so making sure that they have lots available to them at all times is very important. Um, and then just making sure they have a small amount of mineralized salt available, especially if they're housed outdoors and it's, it's very warm out. Um, and then we want to just make sure we do this because this is going to ensure our optimal breeding and reproduction and meat production. Whatever the rabbits are being used for, we want to make sure that their diet is going to optimize that. Something that is not as well known in rabbits is that they practice something called cecotrophy. And so this is essentially a second type of fecal material that they produce and it's consumed directly from their anus. And so this is a picture of a, a kind of a packet of cecotrophs on the, the side of the screen here. They're not the most pleasant uh, thing to look at. Some people describe them as looking like a ball of grapes. Um, 
And this is a normal behavior. So some people are quite alarmed by this behavior, but it's it's quite normal. And essentially it's done in order to be the most efficient efficient digestive system possible. Um, and they do this by basically consuming these and getting a lot more protein and vitamin B um, and other minerals and vitamins from that food the second time around. Um, and so it does mean that when they're on really high protein diets, they may actually not eat all of their cecotrophs um, because the cecotrophs have that high protein in them. So they may not actually have those high needs um, if they're on a really high protein diet. There's varying types of feeding system for feeding systems for production rabbits. And so um, the three most common that we think of are an extensive system where essentially the system is completely dependent on forages and kitchen waste. And so this is a cheap and easy system. So basically um, it allows you to easily provide that quantity of food, um, but the forage is certainly gonna avail be variable depending on the season that you're in and what you have may have varying quality. Um, but it is labor intensive, obviously, that you have to do all of this on your own. Um, and certainly if you're not entirely sure where some of that is coming from, or if there is um, diseases associated with some of those forages or waste, then you risk disease introduction into your herd. Versus an intensive system is the complete flip-flop of that, where essentially you're completely dependent on prepared concentrates that come from the food mill. Um, this is very good for having a high level of production. Obviously these high concentrates are high in calories, high in protein, um, and has a least risk of disease introduction simply because they're coming from these kind of formulated facilities. Um, but it is quite expensive and it does depend if you have a good feed mill or not that can give you um, good, good feed with high quality. Um, a semi-intensive system is somewhat in between these two where Essentially, you have forages that you are then supplementing with prepared concentrates. And this is what a lot of producers will do, especially our small scale producers. One of the key things in keeping rabbits is record keeping. And so this is essential to making sure you have good management, good health, and an ongoing healthy herd. Um, and so some of the things that you should have when you do record keeping are hutch cards. So that allows you to identify which rabbit is in which hutch um, and making sure they have a good and method of identification. So either a tattoo, an ear clip or a tag. And so you can see in this little New Zealand white here, he's got a tattoo on the inside of his ear. Um, and then this also allows you to keep track of their breeding, kindling and weaning. So you know exactly how well each of those rabbits are doing. And this is gonna allow you to be the most successful possible. It's also important to keep in mind how we can prevent injuries. So this is extremely important for management and welfare of the rabbits that are in your herd. And so anything that has improper handling associated with it can result in injuries. So this image here is just showing someone improperly picking up a rabbit by its ear. So that's not something that um, is recommended. It's actually quite stressful and painful for the rabbit and can cause quite a bit of trauma. Um, other things that we can think about that cause injuries would be if you have a slippery hutch. Um, so rabbits are not always the most uh, coordinated on slippery floors, and so they can injure themselves quite dramatically that way. Um, if the wires in your cage are too far apart, they could either get something stuck in them, so a limb, um, or if they're, they're really large and they stick their face through, they might get stuck. Um, and then being a prey species, rabbits are startled very easily. And especially if they have some of these other factors like a slippery floor, you startle them, they try and run away on a slippery floor and they can get quite injured. Um, of course, sanitation and disease control are key to the successful herd management in them. And so daily cleaning and making sure that the ventilation is proper, especially in some of those stacked um, kind of hutch systems where they may not have the best ventilation. Their urine can be quite strong smelling. Um, and so we just need to make sure that we're able to ventilate those hutches very well for them so that they're not breathing that in all the time. Um, considering culling any of your unhealthy and diseased individuals. So there's a lot of infectious diseases that these guys can get um, that then become kind of endemic in your, your herd of them. And so you wanna make sure if you do notice unhealthy rabbits that they're either being kind of managed and treated and separated um, or potentially called depending on the severity of signs. Um, certainly avoiding overcrowding is very important. 
Um, and then, like I said, quarantining and separating sick animals. So that's really, really important. When one animal is noted to be sick, they should be transferred to a separate facility um, on your property somewhere and um, kind of done last in terms of their management. So clean them last, do everything with them last so that you're not potentially transmitting what they have back to your healthy rabbits. Um, having really good solid nutrition for them. And then of course, if you're breeding them, making sure that you're selecting for good traits for them. So that was just a very brief overview of kind of management and welfare of rabbits um, in a herd type setting. But essentially um, we wanna make sure that we have a clean, appropriately ventilated um, system with rabbits that are being closely observed. We wanna make sure they have protection from all of those elements, both internally and externally. And then of course, having that most optimal nutrition depending on what class of rabbits that they fall into. And that's all. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Gardhouse for bringing those comments and encouraging words for those who uh, want to venture into or are currently operating uh, within the rabbit subsector of the specialty livestock industry. I do want to just make a reminder note that um, based on previous years, um, we've led up and developed today's schedule to address some of the basic husbandry needs and animal care, uh, whether it be veterinary or husbandry for the specialty livestock industry with resources that are housed at our land grant institution here at Kansas State University in Manhattan and available to folks across the state um, because the mission of land grant is to serve the people of Kansas. So thank you. We're gonna continue moving on and we will answer questions as time allows. So please drop those in the chat box. Um, if we do not have time for questions, we'll purposefully direct those to content experts who have been on the call. At this time, I'm going to transition the podium to my colleague, Dana Ladner, and she's going to transition us into hearing from um, everyday practitioners who have a vested interest in the specialty livestock industry across the state. So Dana. Great, thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, and thank you for everybody that's participating today, especially those on our producer panel. And this evening we have with us, Amy and Matt Benz, Shirley and Larry Plumley, and Sharon Hymas. And we have asked our producer panel to introduce themselves, to tell us a little bit about how they got started in the livestock industry, being that they are in that specialty livestock industry, you know, how they market their livestock and finish their commodities. So, and also how they developed a circle of resources. So with that, I will put those questions in the chat so those uh, we'll be able to follow along with us today, but we're going to start with Matt and Amy Benz uh, at St. Mary's, so with the Benz Rambouillet. So, Matt and Amy. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, started in the sheep business, or how did we get in? It's a generational thing. Uh, my family's been in since uh, immigrated to the United States in the late 1800s, at one time having as many as 10,000 used in North in Southwestern North Dakota. Uh, so that's how we got there. And it's just, they're addictive. Um, how do we market our livestock? We, we raise seed stock. We market nationwide as well as Mexico and, and Canada at times. Uh, mostly anymore, it's off the farm sales. Uh, but we also go to some national sales and regional sales in in uh, higher sheep producing areas. Uh, we do a lot of advertising on our Facebook page. And uh, in the last two years, we've sold sheep from Oh, like I said, Canada to Texas to Virginia, New Hampshire, out to Arizona and Utah. Um, resources. Um, we're both college graduates with uh, emphasis in animal science, but the true knowledge you get is from people and involvements in state and national uh, sheep associations, I think is probably where where we make most of our contacts. We also uh, have a good vet, good relationship with our veterinarian. 
uh, extension people, not only in Kansas, but throughout the country. Um, you had anything to add? Yeah, um, the other resources, I guess, that we kind of fell into here that's different than North Dakota. We spent a lot of years in North Dakota and moved here about seven years ago. And uh, we found that there's a lot more feed mills here and uh, we're able to access a lot of different feed sources. And so that was really a nice option for us um, and being able to choose what we wanted to feed instead of having to feed what was available. Um, we all, and the quality and how that, that all worked. Um, another uh, thing that we had have is a co-grazing opportunity with our son-in-law. He raises, or they raise uh, registered Angus cattle and he had a really nice pasture that we put sheep on and he put cattle in and he's very pleased with what the pasture looks like um, because of that cool grazing that Dr. Crane talked about and um, taking care of a lot of the cedars and some other weeds uh, that the sheep will eat that the, cow the cattle won't. Um, and we run a donkey with those sheep and, oh, and that also helps them move around the pasture a little bit. Um, but back to marketing just a little bit. Um, I wanted to mention just because uh, we are seed stock people, we don't spend a lot of time and, and effort on, um, on selling lamb itself, but uh, we're both involved in the um, Kansas Sheep Association and the Sheep Council. And those are opportunities that I think uh, we need to think about. And through COVID and other uh, ways, Kansas Farms has really started to um, promote and, and be, have lamb available. Um, and that was something that um, we saw it take off and it's been reflected in the market now that mar uh, that lamb is being consumed and um, it's available, you know, before you'd have to go to a high end restaurant and some of that is still true or to um, sometimes at Sam's or at, uh, you know, a higher end grocery store, you might find some lamb. Now you can find it a lot more locally. And that's been a, a positive thing that came out of the um, uh, out of COVID, I think. Um, so uh, we're pleased to be a part of this tonight. And if you have questions, please post those and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Great, thank you very much for that great introduction. With that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Shirley and Larry Plumley. They're with the Plumley Buffalo Ranch at Alma. Would you guys like to uh, give us a preview of what's going on on your uh, ranch and how you got involved with things? Uh, good evening. Um, a big part of our operation is agritourism, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We have raised bison for 18 years. Uh, we live right on I-70, so we have a great location for visitors to find us. Uh, we initially just had lots of people stopping in, asking questions. We want to see the bison, so we decided to create a tour, put together a tour, and charge for it, and so we could actually share information. The first step was to create a website, which is plumleyranch.com. If you want to know more about us, you can go to our website. Uh, that is a valuable help. Uh, we made it clear on our website that we do tours by appointment only. So that eliminated the drop-in, um, making it a lot more convenient to schedule tours. Because we live on 400 acres, we have to take people out to the bison. So we um, put up signs on our property, large signs, so the people could find us more easily, giving our phone number uh, so they could contact us. Uh, we are registered with Kansas Agritourism, which puts us on their website. That helps people find us. Uh, by doing that, it also gives us um, extra liability that is provided, thankfully, by the state of Kansas for agritourism people. Uh, we also uh, pay for an ad in the Kansas travel guide every year, and a lot of people pick up that information and find us that way. Uh, we have designed a brochure that we uh, give people that's available at a lot of local area businesses, restaurants, uh, travel centers, 
So a lot of people find us that way. And I've created a Facebook page for the ranch. So I can post pictures, visitors can post pictures, um, talk about their experience when they came to see us. Uh, we purchased two uh, utility vehicles that are two feet each. So we can accommodate four to six, um, like three adults and two to three kids in each vehicle so we can drive through our Flint Hills over our big rocks and actually get people up close to our herd and explain about the bison, uh, what we do, how they're different from cattle. We also take people to um, our fish pond, which is a big hit for all the little kids. Some preschoolers aren't too excited about big brown animals, but they all love feeding the fish. And that's a memorable event for little kids. Uh, we have natural springs on our property, so we explain that to our visitors. Um, then we bring them back inside our home. We have a couple of rooms dedicated just for visitors. Um, we have um, souvenir items for sale. And we also sell most of our meat retail here at our ranch. So I can guarantee people that we're selling. Um, thank you for posting our website there. Uh, we can guarantee people that the meat they're buying was produced, born, raised on our ranch. It's never been given antibiotics. It's never been given growth hormones. And it's totally grass finished. So our customers come back to us because they want all natural, very lean, healthy meat. We do sell uh, some of our meat to restaurants and grocery stores. We also had a printer create a label for our meat that we put on packages that go to grocery stores. So it's easy to identify our meat to, from other sources. Um, we have also had requests from large groups. So my husband created tour wagons from 12 foot utility vehicles that have comfortable car seats on them. So they're very popular with senior citizens. And so we do get larger groups coming from retirement homes, parks and recs, summer camps. So we can accommodate larger groups also. Uh, we really have not spent a large amount of money on advertising. Uh, having done this for 18 years, we get a lot of our visitors and our meat customers from word of mouth um, recommendations. And that's really valuable whether you're doing agritourism or selling your product directly is recommendations from other people. So Larry's going to talk a little bit about actually raising the animals which are very easy to take care of. Uh, we started in 2003 with two buffalo, and uh, our ranch was across from the Manhattan Airport. A lot of you probably remember that. And we only had 65 acres there, so 2009, we moved out to uh, I-70 ranch out here, which gave us 400 acres of good native grass. Uh, our herd right now averages around 70 animals uh, because we grass feed all of our uh, animals to butcher and it takes three years when you're grass feeding buffalo to get them to a thousand pounds and that's the size that we butcher them. The, uh, the cows, yeah, they run with a bull year round. Uh, they only breed in August, so they have their babies in uh, June. They don't conceive until they're three years old, and so uh, we have no cabin problems whatsoever. Uh, 
The bulls are sterile until they're three years old, so we don't have any castration problems. Uh, a lot of the work, we're both off cattle ranches, and a lot of the work that we had on the cattle ranches was giving them shots, getting the cows to take the calves, uh, and uh, when they when they were having a calf, a lot of times they have a cold with buffalo, you know, if they ever have any calves involved. The females take the calves, great mothers. Uh, we don't have to give or hurt any vaccination. When we had our cattle ranches here in Raleigh County, we used the uh, K-State uh, vet clinic a lot in the C-section. We had sick cow or something, and they're just absolutely great, lovely kids. And we have the same kids that go into the vet school now come out to the uh, Buffalo and uh, because they don't get a lot in the vet school on Buffalo. And I think they're just amazed uh, uh, with, that we don't have any sickness in the herd. In 18 years, we've lost two cows, one from whitening and the other from death joint. So they just seem like they're just uh, God's gift to this prairie out here. We love raising them. And uh, we enjoy giving tours in. So. Well, that is great information from you guys. You've had a lot going on there in Alma, right off the interstate. Where I've seen your signs with it and really super exciting things with that. Right now, I want to go home, over and uh, check in with Sharon Hymas. She is with Mana Meadows Alpacas in Bonner Springs. Sharon, why don't you tell us what's going on in your world? <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here and to um, uh, tell people a little bit about how we got started in our um, farm here. Um, a little bit of a different start for us. It actually came from an infomercial. I say that my husband is the poster child for infomercials. He watched one one night back in 2000 and um, had never heard of alpacas before and was very intrigued because we both love to work with fiber and uh, anything that has to do with fiber. So we actually went up to the Northwest where a lot of alpacas were at that time and spent a weekend on an alpaca farm and fell in love with the animals and decided that was something that we would want to do. But it took 10 years before we actually got our alpaca herd. Um, we got it from a little farm down in Gardner. So we started with nine and um, I'm going to skip, I know we're really limited on time, I'm going to skip down to how did we develop a circle of resources because I think the most important thing we did was develop a mentorship relationship with the people that we bought our alpacas from. They were a wealth of information um, when it came to feed and shelter and just anything that you needed, that alpacas needed, they had had experience. So we've been raising alpacas for 11 years. We currently um, have 20 that we have on the farm. We've been up as high as 50 before, but we do breed and sell the animals um, as well as they are shorn once a year and we use their fiber. We have it processed into yarn and use it for making um, things. And again, limited time, networking is incredibly important. Um, we also do a lot of agritourism, so I'm not going to um, belabor that point. point. We've joined TripAdvisor. Um, we've had our uh, articles from Parent Magazine, Visit KC. So we're kind of a little unique place um, here. In, and we're in Bonner Springs, by the way. <clears throat> Uh, we do do alpaca shows uh, with some of our animals that we think are worthy of it. And that is a great place to network and again, find out how different people um, do different things on their farm. And we visited a lot of farms before we got ours. And I wanted to address, before I close, I mean, if you, we do open houses, we do all that kind of stuff. We do a lot of self-education. Um, but there was a question about what is the main crop from alpacas was in the chat. And I would say the main crop are babies, if you're a breeder, if you're not a breeder, or even if you are a breeder, and their fleece, um, which we call fiber rather than wool because it's very different than sheep, sheep fleece. Um, those are really the two things that I would consider crops from alpacas. So we love it. They're great animals. They're easy to keep. Um, 
and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Well, Sharon, I just want to stay with you. Um, and we are going to kind of combine two questions here at the end um, for our panelists. Like I say, we are uh, running a little short on time with that. But the question that I have to you and, and all three of our producers here today um, is what would you say would be the one obstacle that you continue to have or experience in your operation? And what would you have for the one takeaway that you would like to see for an action item for the upcoming year? I'll put that in the chat so you guys can see it. So again, what is your number one obstacle? And two, what would you like to see as an action item for the upcoming year for the specialty livestock? Sharon? Um, all righty, well, the biggest obstacle that we come across as breeders is a lack of, um, when people come to buy alpacas, they have not done their homework very much and they don't know what the needs of the alpacas are and they might, whether they, um, we won't, we actually won't sell to them unless they have a great understanding of what is needed. Um, but we see a lot of people, unfortunately, that purchase alpacas that don't take care of them um, very well and end up rehoming them or their rescue alpacas or something. So alpacas are not like any other animal or, you know, they're close to llamas, but they're, um, they do require some special, you know, protection <laughs> and feed and things like that. And people need to do their homework before they go and look at alpacas. Um, and uh, the takeaways, um, I, we did a seminar on, on making a business plan, which I think is incredibly important if you're going to be in the alpaca industry, um, making a business plan and then reviewing it, you know, every four to six months or whatever to see if it needs to be changed, updated or anything like that. Because we started as breeders, then we went to um, producing, you know, from our yarn, producing scarves and hats and things like that. And then finally to agritourism. So we have a three pronged actually business plan right now. Um, and it's changed a lot. So that's what, that would be my take home is make a business plan. Wow, that's great information. Matt and Amy, what would you guys like to uh, contribute as far as the biggest obstacle that you see for the sheep industry uh, as producers and with your interactions with the association and what would you like to see as one takeaway for an act action item for the coming year? I think probably the biggest problem in the sheep industry in Kansas and probably across the country is there's a lot of new people getting into the getting into the industry and we're not very good at letting them know where to get information from um a lot of them will ask questions on Facebook forums and actually get a lot of really bad information. We need to figure out how to, how to contact those people and, and get the right information in their hands and get them. I mean, some of these people don't even know that there is an extension office in every county in the country or, you know, just about. So that probably answers both your questions because I think that's something to work on for the next year is get these new producers in not only in, in sheep and, and goats, but in every species uh, where they can get good and good solid information that isn't maybe sketchy like some of the responses on Facebook can be. It is great to hear about K-State Research and Extension and having unbiased scientific information. So that's the best thing about it. So with that, Shirley and Larry, what do you have to contribute here for uh, the takeaway and an obstacle? Our biggest obstacle now is the uh, local meat lockers. Right now, uh, you have to be booked out two years to get your hands on the meat. Uh, I think what's going to get worse, I think the state uh, inspection system needs to be set up for uh, maybe they inspect our area where we could do some butchering here. I don't know what the answer is, but 
uh, we're going to bottleneck this meat situation if we don't get something done. That's what we got. Great. Thank you very much to our producers. We appreciate the information and your time this evening. Um, so with that, I think in the interest of time, we've had some questions in the chat. We've had some answered with that. So um, Tori, if we can just quickly look at that and then we will turn it over to Shirley. Tori? Thank you, Dana. As before, my name is Tori Laird. I have been watching this chat box a little bit. And there is one question that I think can be posed to the group. Um, we had one question come in that was asking um, about meat goat demand and seeing that increase in recent years, um, asking where the demand is coming from inside or outside of Kansas. Um, I don't know if any of our experts might have a, a point on this um, or any of our producer panel. I know our one producer who does work with meat goats was unfortunately unable to join at this time, but um, maybe our experts might have an uh, opinion on the matter. Yeah, this is Allison um, Crane. So I was kind of working on an answer here. Um, and across all camelids and then um, meat goats, because there was another question about the camelids and products too. So I kind of put together a whole answer, but with the products, I know someone kind of provided part of an answer, but typically it's fiber um, or milk, especially when we're talking about camels. Um, and then the, you can make cheeses and such out of that. Um, another one that wasn't mentioned is especially with llamas and alpacas too, but um, people, especially out West are using them for pack animals, but, and then throughout the country is guard, livestock guardian animals. Um, so it's not necessarily a tangible product, um, but definitely they're being used that way. Um, and then with the meat goat demand, uh, my question or my answer was yes, it, it's everywhere. It's not just Kansas that the demand is increasing, but throughout the country, um, numbers are increasing, demand is increasing. Um, but we're still importing about 90% of our goat product that is consumed. Um, and some of that's chilled, some of it's frozen, um, but most of it's from either Australia or New Zealand. We, we're not producing enough goat meat um, to meet our demand. And a lot of that demand is coming from um, the ethnic market. Yes, is the most popular answer. Um, but with that, there's also the ethnic restaurants um, and it's actually becoming more of a gourmet um, product in some of those restaurants as well. Um, and so it's kind of on both sides of that. So, um, but then there's also the demand with them as a grazing tool. Um, and more and more people are using that as kind of an entrepreneurial um, venture, um, whether it's grazing or just an easy way to get into a livestock business um, slightly cheaper um, with a lot of return. So I don't know if that answers the question in its entirety, but um, tried to hit everything. Thank you, Dr. Crane. Uh, that question was great. That answer to that question was great. I think we are all out of time for questions at this time, but we will take questions from the chat and bring back a response to all of our attendees. And I will move on and hand the mic over to Shirley. Thank you, Tori. Um, Sean, can you put that poll up quickly, please? Um, this poll is comprised of industry identified desired growth outcomes for the specialty livestock sector. If you could just take a couple of minutes and um, choose your top three priorities, um, we'd appreciate that. And if you have a specific industry need that you wish to address, please just drop that into the chat and we will work on that. Um, throughout the year. I'll just give you a couple of minutes here. And as a follow-up, while you guys are following, filling out that polling, thank you very much. Um, we just recently released the sheep and goat survey that KDA worked with Kansas State to develop this past year. And we finally have those results available. I just dropped the link in the chat 
So if you wanna have a chance to check that out soon, it'll be right there. Okay, so it's, it's looking like um, we have a tie right here. We have additional K-State research and extension personnel to support specialty livestock production and access to education and extension programs on husbandry and management with focus on nutrition and veterinary resources. And that's no surprise to us from what we've heard tonight from everybody. So um, we will um, move forward the next year working on these outcomes. Um, and we sure appreciate you taking the time tonight. And I'm gonna pass this on to Carrie for some closing comments. We're running pretty late on time. Sorry about that, folks. Very good. So we're three minutes over, uh, but I just wanna extend a hearty thank you um, to our content experts, to our panelists, and to some new groups like our Kansas honey producers who are joining us for the first time um, for the specialty livestock sector. So thank you to everyone who made time this evening to hear the testimonials from across the state on this um, important industry to our state. Secondly, we will capture all of the chat comments and we will do follow-up outreach with each of you who have posed a question that has not been answered thus far um, due to our time constraints. So in closing today, I just again simply want to thank you I hope you were able to listen, learn, and uh, maybe have interest peaked into stopping and visiting some of our specialty livestock producers, um, noting whether they take an appointment or you can certainly just stop in depending on what their website or their Facebook groups might say. Uh, we will proceed on August 26th with an in-person Kansas Ag Growth Summit in Manhattan. We welcome your participation either on site in person or through a virtual registration option. Registration is open for this event and um, the registration access is at www.agriculture.ks.gov backslash summit. So we hope and encourage um, that you'll make a day and come to Manhattan or join virtually. Secondly, I want to highlight that this is the second year the Department of Agriculture will be um, offering the Kansas Ag Heroes Program. We encourage you to submit nominations of an individual or a family or a business operating within the Kansas agriculture sector that you feel have provided a notable contribution to the agriculture industry and their community um, this past year. The nomination period is open for the Kansas Ag Heroes uh, Program and it will close on August 13th. So know you're always welcome to engage with Kansas Department of Agriculture events, whether it's follow up via email or actually attending um, an event such as the Ag Summit that will be held on August 26th. In closing, again, just a hearty thank you for spending your evening with us. A lot of valuable information was shared and we wish you the best for the remainder of the evening and the remainder of your work week. Thank you.